lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. There is no figure given more attention that his theology did not warrant than John Calvin. John Calvin was born 1509. He had absolutely nothing to do with the Protestant Reformation, incipiently, initially, nothing. When Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door in Wittenberg in October of uh, 1517, John Calvin would have been about eight years old. When Erasmus published his Greek New Testament, that precipitated the Reformation, he would have been about seven years old. He was a little kid. He had nothing to do with any of it. In the days of Luther and, and Tyndale, he had nothing to do with any of it. Later on, he was not even a second generation reformer. He's into the third generation now. He had contact with Busser and Pharrell. He had no contact with Luther. He only had contact with Melanchthon, one of Luther's deputies. Calvin came along much, much later to put his stamp on the Reformation. But he himself had nothing to do with it. He was a little kid. In fact, he was in Roman Catholicism until at least his teens. Now, let's understand something. Nothing that he wrote was particularly original in any foundational sense. He got certain things from Luther and the other reformers via Melanchthon. He got things from Martin Busser, and he got things from Pharrell. And he got things all the way back to the patristic age, particularly from Augustine. But what Calvinists don't like to admit is the truth about Augustine, neither do they like to admit something else, the connection between Aquinas and the Dominican order and John Calvin, where John Calvin got so much of his theology, not just from Roman Catholicism, but from the most barbaric and corrupt expression of it. The idea of predestination has roots in Judaism. The Sadducees, who did not believe in a per se afterlife as such, were determinists. They were fatalistic. The Pharisees said in the Torah Baal Pei, later written and recorded, all is foreseen, but the choice is given. Jesus, apart from the issue of marriage and the oral law and the materialism and so forth, those were major issues, but apart from those issues, Jesus usually agreed with the Pharisees, not the Sadducees. The Sadducees were anti-supernaturalist rationalists. They did not believe in the angelic, the resurrection, and so forth. They were in some sense theologically liberal in a matter of speaking, although others would say that they were more conservative because they didn't accept the oral law. But this is something that scholars dispute among themselves and have done for generations. Jesus normally, however, agreed with the Pharisees on issues like this. All is foreseen, but the choice is given. Speaking of Judas, Jesus said, the son of man must be betrayed, for it is written. But woe by him by whom he is betrayed, it would be better for that man had he not been born. Judas had personal culpability, and he had a choice. By dipping the sop at the Paschal Seder, Jesus was giving Judas a chance to make a decision. Calvinism has always confused the foreknowledge of God 
with the determined plan of God. God could have caused those Old Testament prophecies to be fulfilled in a different way had he wanted to. Israel had a choice to accept or reject its own Messiah. God foreknew they would reject, except for a faithful remnant. And he did incorporate that into his plan, but he did not harden their hearts. Jesus said they hardened their own. Now let's understand this. Let's come forward. The Emperor Constantine pseudo-Christianizes the Roman Empire. The worldview of the Roman Empire was predominantly Platonic philosophy, which had some points in contact with the Gospel, although very different from the Gospel in other aspects. Augustine Platonized the Church. He took a theology and turned it into a Greek philosophy. He Hellenized it along the lines of Platonic philosophy. John Calvin was the same thing. Calvinism is not actually doctrinal theology. In essence, it is philosophy masquerading as theology. Let's go further. Augustine was influenced by Ambrose of Milan, who believed that the church should be a civil power, contrary to the teaching of Jesus, who said his kingdom was not of this world. He declined political power when it was offered him. He was also influenced by Cyprian of Carthage, a sacramentalist. Augustine was a Platonist who believed in the sinlessness of Mary. He believed in the Immaculate Conception. He believed in the canonicity of apocryphal books. He believed the church should be a political power. And he was a sacramentalist. He believed in an ex opere operato power of sacraments, taking salvation out of the hands of the Lord and putting it into the hands of the Roman church as it became, as facilitated by ritualistic sacramentalism. He believed this stuff. He is the chief architect of what evolved as Roman Catholicism. Now, the institution of Roman Catholicism began to develop under the Emperor Justinian and under uh, Pope Gregory I, so-called Gregory the Great, and, and, he, and, and it evolved further from there over a period of centuries, all the way through the time of the Council of Trent. Nonetheless, its germ cell, its seminal influence, philosophically and theologically, if you want to call Augustine a theologian, is with Augustine. Everything had to be rewritten now to facilitate Christianity becoming the religion of the empire. What had been Christianity now becomes Christendom. He spiritualizes away the millennial reign of Christ. He begins using allegorical interpretation of scripture not to illustrate doctrine, as in typology, or as in Midrash, but as a basis for doctrine. Mary can see without sin, sacramental salvation, and the institutionalization of the church. Instead of the church being a fellowship of fellowships held together by one faith, one baptism, it becomes an organization with a political and indeed a financial aspect to it that evolves into the papacy. When the Donatists attempted to hold to biblical Christianity against the way the church was gravitating under the politicization of it after the Council of Nicaea with Constantine and so forth, Augustine said the church can use violence. And he castigated these people. He castigated the faithful Christians. There are other founders of Roman Catholicism than Augustine, but he's the main one. This is where John Calvin got his essential doctrine. Go forward. Perhaps the leading Calvinistic Reformed Church historian in the United States, perhaps the leading one, some would say he's the leading one, 
is Professor James McGoldrick, Professor of Medieval Church History at the Greenville Presbyterian Seminary in the USA. Very good writer, don't like his theology. He's one of these typical Calvinists who try to virtually equate Arminianism with the heresy of Pelagianism. Not to the extent some do, but he has that leaning. Nonetheless, he's a good historian. He admits, as have many Calvinistic historians, but McGoldrick wrote on it most comprehensively, that at the time of Calvin, you had the influences of Thomas Aquinas, who using medieval scholasticism asked eight questions about the foreknowledge of God in his book, The Summa Theologia. The Dominican order, hence, were predeterminists, predeterminists. Reacting against them after the Reformation was the Jesuit Luis de Molina, founder of Molinism, who rejected this. The Calvinists like to say that Molinism is really a sanitized form of Pelagianism. This whole thing, however, was an argument going on within Roman Catholicism in the 16th century. Calvin, coming from Catholicism, brings this with him and comes down on the side of the Dominicans, influenced by Aquinas. He mentions Aquinas in his Institutes of the Christian Religion with some favor, even though he disagreed with him on certain points, certainly, he did not consider him to be a heretic. Hence, the predetermination or predetermination, the predeterminist views of the Dominicans were adopted by none other than John Calvin against the Jesuit views of Molinism. This whole thing becomes a big fight within the Roman Church. Pope Clement V orders an investigation to attempt to reconcile it called the Congregatio de Auxiles, chaired by the Bishop of Armagh in Northern Ireland, Peter Lombard. And finally, there was a papal decree that they had to accept each other. <laughs> Calvin, however, was not a Catholic. It didn't apply to him. Hence, John Calvin got his theology from Augustine, somebody who believed in the Immaculate Conception and who believed in sacramental regeneration, somebody who believed in the institutionalization of the church and a crackdown using violence on those who were not in it, among his many other crimes against God and humanity. This was Augustine. The one good thing he did, the one thing he was right about, was his opposition to Pelagius. But what all Calvinists do, more or less, I can't say every one of them, but most of them certainly, that anybody who does not subscribe to the false teachings of John Calvin, is charged as being Pelagian, denying original sin, which is a lie. Their attempts to equate Wesleyan Arminianism with Pelagianism or with the, the nearly Pelagian views of Charles Finney are completely untrue. They're defamatory. Nonetheless, that's their mindset. They cannot deny the facts. Calvin had nothing to do with the Reformation. He was a little boy. His ideas, none of them came from him. They came from Augustine and they came from the Dominicans. The same Dominicans responsible for the Inquisitions, the torture, <coughs> who set up theocratic police states in Iberia and Italy, mimicked by Calvin in Geneva. It's like the Papal States, that's what he wanted. Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. The use of violence, the whole bit, he got it from Roman Catholicism, but he got it somewhere else. 
the Dominicans were strongly influenced in the aftermath of the Crusades by Islam. The whole idea of Inja Allah, anything that happens is God's perfect will, finds its equivalent in the predeterminationism of the Dominicans that becomes Calvin's view of predestination. The use of violence, torture, a theocratic police state. These were the Dominicans who supposedly gave us the rosary. Their Saint Dominic, who never actually wrote anything himself, said that the Madonna appeared to him holding the baby and, and, and gave him the beads. In fact, the Crusades brought these beads back from the East. It was done in Vishnu, Hindu worship with the spice trade that the troubadours brought back to Europe in the Crusade era, and it was done in Islam. The beads became the rosary. The flagellation rituals copied from the Shia Muslims commemorating the Battle of Kabbalah with Ali. This became the flagellation rituals of the convents and monasteries of Europe. Because Roman Catholicism does not believe the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, you must atone for your own in purgatory while well, you can make a down payment by beating yourself now. <laughs> These are the Dominicans, the people who gave us the Inquisition, the Dominicans, Petzl, the indulgence merchants who raised the money to build St. Peter's in the Vatican by going around preaching when a coin into the box rings, a soul from purgatory springs, and he'd give these emotive sermons about someone with a recently dead mother begging their son to give the money to get her out of purgatory. She's being burned up, tortured. Tetzel preached and Luther heard him. One of the things that set Luther's flame alight was when he heard Tetzel say, you can sexually violate Mary, the mother of Jesus, and be forgiven if you have the right price. These are the Dominicans. Now, there was a Dominican who went against this, a renegade, who I believe was in all likelihood a true believer named Savonola, but they murdered him. The Dominicans were terrible people. They're the people of the Inquisition. This is where Calvin got his doctrine. Thomas Aquinas, the Thomist, the Aristotelian, a Dominican. John Calvin was nothing more than somebody who recycled the beliefs of Roman Catholicism, calling it Protestantism. He did the same things as the Dominicans, and he did the same thing as the Muslims who influenced the Dominicans after the Crusades. That's what he was. That's what he did. All the way back to Augustine. I've often said the Christian world would be better off had there been no Augustine. The one correct thing he did was refute Pelagius, but others could have done that probably better than he did. John Calvin is an unfortunate individual. Those who follow him are revisionists. They have to rewrite history to explain or circumvent or circumlocute their way around these realities that their own scholars admit are true. It's always to say, oh, you have to look at the overall picture. I have looked at the overall picture. It's a disgrace and a mess. Now let's understand further. The term Calvinism was first used by Lutheran scholars who debated them over certain issues such as the Lord's Supper, such as um, Westfeld, Westfeld and so forth. They debated them. Uh, it had to do with Calvin's view of the Lord's Supper and liturgy and things like this. It was the Lutherans who were first calling them Calvinists. What we call Calvinism today, they call the doctrines of grace. It's the remonstrance of Dort. It came from Beza, not from Calvin. You will not find the tulip in Calvin's writings. It's not in his institutes. Calvin's basis was covenant theology. 
the nonsense, the utter nonsense that God only ever made two covenants, one with Adam and one with Abraham. Not the old and new, but the Adamic and the Abrahamic. That was the basis to Calvin's so-called theology. This Dort stuff came later by Beza, not Calvin. And they call it a doctrine of grace or the doctrines of grace. <laughs> the doctrines of grace of Augustine were sacramental. They were Roman Catholic doctrines of grace. They were not scriptural. While pretending to be sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gracia, sola Cristo, only scripture, sola scriptura, Calvin appealed to patristic authority, not to apostolic authority purely. He kept saying, by the authority of Augustine, Augustine, Augustine. <laughs> it was not scriptura sola. It was a perversion of scripture. Philosophically akin to Islam, borrowed from the Dominicans, having its origins to a large degree with Augustine, the primary founder of Roman Catholicism. This is why Calvin's Bible of choice was never the Greek or Hebrew, it was the Latin Vulgate, the Roman Catholic Bible of Jerome. You couldn't make this up. No Calvinist can deny a single word of what I've said. All they can do is give you a lot of philosophical extrapolation trying to circumvent the issue. They cannot deny what Augustine really believed or that Augustine directly influenced Calvin. They cannot deny it. Neither can they deny what Calvin took from the Dominican Aquinas. They cannot deny it. They cannot deny that this whole predestination issue is an issue within Roman Catholicism. They cannot deny it. They cannot deny his theocratic police state in Geneva, his consistory. They cannot deny what he did, the burning of people in the name of Christ. They cannot deny any of it. Yet they call it doctrines of grace. Calvin never even taught the tulip. That's what people said about Calvin. It's not what Calvin said. The tulip itself is a ridiculous lie. Limited atonement? That a God of love created people to torture them forever in hell? Let us look. In Romans chapter 5, we read the following. Verse 17. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression, being Adam, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. It's available to all men. It doesn't just say the so-called elect as the Calvinists misdefine the elect. All men means the elect. No, it doesn't. They have to pervert text out of context to make it a pretext. They do the same thing with 1 Timothy, the savior of all men. All men means all kinds of men. They have to read things into the word of God it does not say and does not intend to say. They must engage in revisionism. They must ignore things they cannot explain and expect you to do the same. They're the theological equivalent of Olenskyists. Olenskyism says, if you're cornered on an issue and you can't talk your way out of it or explain it or defend it or justify it, yell racism and just keep repeating it. 
that's the political strategy of, of corrupt politicians in America. They yell racism when there's a point where they can't get themselves off the hook. So they just yell racism. Well, Calvinists do the same thing. They yell Pelagianism. <laughs> that's their equivalent of racism. Calvinism is theocratic Olenskyism. <laughs> that's all it is. <laughs> it's theocratic Olenskyism. The whole thing is a big, stupid lie. Nobody in their right mind should believe it. And nobody with the spirit of Jesus looking at the word of God can believe it unless they are deceived. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you and God bless.